welcome everybody to the Concordia strategic dialogue session entitled Building an Inclusive and Ethical Digital Future. My name is Josh Rogan. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post. Thank you all for joining us today. Let me tell you a little bit about how this conversation is going to be structured and then we'll get right to the, uh, the content. Uh, basically, we have 90 minutes to solve the problem of how to build an inclusive and ethical digital future. I couldn't think of a better round table of experts and officials to talk about this. Uh, structurally, what we're going to do is I'm going to you know, start each section of this conversation with a broad question. And then uh, if any of the participants would like to speak on that question, simply put your microphone up like this to grab my attention, and I will call on you. Uh, because this is meant to be um, a back and forth, if someone else is making a point and you would like to interject with a short but relevant reaction, you can hold up two fingers, and I will call on you to make a short but relevant reaction, then we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, I'd like to ask you not to press the button in front of you until you are actually ready to speak, because that activates the camera. So that will point the camera at you. Uh, and I would like to <laughs> remind you all that this session is on the record, including the questions. Um, just as a basic introduction, and uh, you know, basically what we've been asked to do here is to come up with practical solutions to lash together what we all see in the private sector and civil society and government in terms of uh, the, the rapid expansion and innovation in, in the digital sector, primarily in the mobile sector, but not just in the mobile sector. And it seems clear, I think, to all of us that uh, these efforts are moving at very different speeds. And that is creating um, practical, but also ethical and also human um, challenges. And I'd like to start with uh, Mats Grindrid, uh, who is the head of GSMA, uh, um, generous enough to sponsor this event, uh, to sort of take the first sh shot at answering that question. How do we lash up the rapid pace of innovation in the private sector with the somewhat less rapid pace of policy making and implementation in civil society and government? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I, I don't think that's a, that easy question to, to answer, but I read a book from uh, Professor Carlotta Perez, who uh, was a professor at Cambridge, I think, and uh, she had uh, investigated the five in the world, there's been five industrial evolution, industrial evolution, starting with the industrial revolution and then onwards to the ICT sector in 1970. And the, the commonality with these five is that they all have the same pattern. They, there's invention and you have roughly 30 years of growth and in the last couple of years there's a bubble being created. The bubble bursts, politicians and regulators sit down and say, you know what? This was really uh, a uh, horrible experience with this bubble being burst, but actually the invention is pretty good, so let's start to regulate it. Then you have a period of three to five years where the regulators regulate this invention. Then it starts over again. Then you have another 30 years of good growth with the same invention the first 30 years. So you actually have a 60-year period with three to five years in between of regulation. So that's a long-winding way of saying that I don't think that regulation will ever be able to keep up. I, I'm pretty sure that the innovation, the power of innovation, the power of wanting to provide consumers with better services and, and more value add will always drive businesses forward. What I think is happening now is that we're seeing a, um, a readjustment of just looking at the profit dimension, but also looking at the people and the planet dimension. And the planet dimension here at this setting, here in New York this, this, this week, is overshadowing everything. And I think that is a healthy debate. Uh, that we're not just focusing on profit, but also the people and the planet dimension. Profit is always going to be important, but people and, and planet also. So I think we need to be um, very much aware that regulation will always be slower. Uh, Public-private partnership has never been more important. Partnership uh, as a whole in these days is what is going to drive this forward. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a quick follow-up, what practical steps do you think governments could do in the near term to address that? Well, I, I, I think that uh, <clears throat> a light touch regulation is always better than a hard touch. I think, you know, let, let it loose and then see what happens. And if you have uh, bottlenecks being created, well, then you might need to go in and regulate. But don't try to uh, 
be uh, creative and, and try to understand what's going to happen because no one can. So better to take it slow and then regulate from, from behind. I think just to add on to what Matt's is saying, um, one of the other things that governments can begin to do is to start to look at how... I'm what sorry, are the, could you just let us know who you are and Sorry, I'm Kate Wilson with the Digital Impact Alliance. Um, one of the other things just to add to Matt's point is I think one of the things we need to do is, is help governments be able to look at choosing and using the digital building blocks that they need to put in place pool that grouping together and then be able to pool financing around it. Because one of the real questions with this or one of the reasons that we have not actually kept pace and we still have three billion people not connected is that we actually haven't fixed the problem that the private sector does not really that interested in investing in providing technology to those who are most underserved because there is not enough of a profit in it yet. That's not their fault. That is exactly the way they are structured. But if we cannot actually bring together these digital public goods and invest in them appropriately, we're not actually going to see a growth in that as well. Well, since we have some government representatives here, maybe next I'll go to the Right Honorable Matthew Rycroft. I'm not actually Right Honorable, but thank you for the promotion. Like saying that. Thank you for the promotion. I hope I'm Honorable. Anyway, um, so I'm Matthew Rycroft. I'm the Permanent Secretary at the UK's Department for International Development, and before that I was the British Ambassador to the United Nations here in New York, and it's a great pleasure to be back. The reason that I wanted to intervene early on was I, uh, to take issue slightly, Josh, with the, with the sense within the question that, you know, private sector good, public sector bad. Private sector speedy, public sector slow. And of course that is sometimes true, but it is sometimes the other way around. Uh, but much more, the, the bigger point I want to make is that on something as tricky as this sort of issue, we can't have enough in them. We can't afford to have a, a division between public and private sectors, and indeed other sectors as well, because this sort of challenge is so big that we have all got to come into it together and play our own parts uh, in the best possible way so that the sum of everything that we're doing uh, is, is, is maximized. Uh, and you know, we've already heard about the important role the public uh, sector can play in terms of uh, regulation, uh, in terms of education, to make sure that the skills are really there amongst the people who need them, infrastructure. Uh, to, you know, these are sort of things which typically in, in countries are, are governmental decisions. And even the framework within, all, within which all of this is operating, the sustainable development goals to end poverty and do so many other stuff for the planet and, and, and other things as well by 2030, those were agreed by governments with a huge amount of private sector and uh, third sector involvement uh, in the drafting of and uh, right now in the implementation of. Well, let me just press you then on uh, Matt's uh, call for a quote unquote light touch on regulation. Do you agree with that? Where, do, where does the regulation come in and how much is absolutely necessary? In, in some sectors, light touch is absolutely right. Uh, in, in, in others, self-regulation will be right, and, and, and in others, are, 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 are heavier. So I, I don't think there's a, a single snappy answer to a, to a complex question like that. Feel free to elaborate. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I made a rod for my own back already so early on in the uh, what was otherwise an, an, uh, uh, an encouraging round table. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I think that uh, um, actually we, uh, some of us were at, a, at an event just yesterday uh, on, on, a, on a similar set of issues, and um, uh, a colleague from Microsoft was calling for government to regulate uh, their sector more robustly than uh, I had expected. I thought that was an interesting uh, challenge back to government to, to, to get, uh, get the uh, environment right uh, in terms of regulation. Uh, and to repeat a point I made there, one of the roles that government I think does have is about the ethics of all of this stuff and really cr creating in all of our societies the sort of conversation um, about uh, what is the ethics of, of, of the technology. And it's quite difficult to do because you know, sometimes you need a decade or so to really understand the ethical dimensions, but we do not have a decade given the pace of, of, of the transformation. Thank you. I'd now like to go to our U.S. government representative, Thomas DeBass of the State Department. This is the same question. Same question, indeed. Um, I want to echo uh, the sentiment that the Honorable uh, Raykoft said. Um, and I'm, I, I don't come from a regulator. I'm much more of a diplomacy uh, output. But uh, there is a huge gap of knowledge. I mean, we, we talked about speed being the currency of the business, uh, kind of the, the private sector. That is true, but uh, the private sector then needs to bring the public sector in terms of just even awareness what that innovation is, right? The perfect example I want to give is M-Pesa in Kenya. 
I think that was Vodafone. Uh, I don't want to misquote my, my telecom there. Uh, and uh, I recall that the regulator of the central bank in Kenya, instead of figuring out whether it's a light touch or a strong touch of it is, one of the things they did is they gave him a leeway to say, we'll give you time to roll this technology out so they can actually learn what they're regulating, right? So there has to be a, a point of interaction with the public sector to ensure what type of regulation to come up with. So I, I would actually ask, I mean not ask, but uh, prompt the, the, the private sector to bring the public sector just even in the know-how, just so they know what they're, especially the speed that technology is shifting, whether it's in privacy or any other things, the, they need to look at the, 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 uh, the, private, the, the public sector folks as an ally to help them so their, their innovations could be go to market, have traction, and so the drawbacks of those technologies does not become a problem. So there has to be not just synergy, but actual collaboration, not just coordination. The word coordination sounds like I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing, and I'm just gonna, just gonna move on. It needs to actually be embedded together so the public sector can have the confidence and the know-how to regulate those markets. So that's the way I would. Thomas, before I move on, are there any examples where you see that happening that could be a model for future? I mean, I think similar things are happening in the AI field. Uh, I was in Casablanca about a year ago, where in Tunisia, that they're viewing AI as a, as a, as a tool for their, for their kind of growth strategy, and they're allowing their private sector to actually do those kind of things. But again, even with AI uh, or IoT, which frankly, relies heavily on the telecom industry's infrastructure, and how do you ensure that those things can work together? So some of it is not just a regulation or the, 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 uh, the element of the telecom industry itself, but it's actually the layers that tops on top of it, because most economic growth strategies happen on the, on the, on the top of the platform. So it needs to be an inclusive model on, the, on those kind of things. Uh, thank you, Doreen. Uh, thank you. Uh, Doreen Bogdan here from the ITU, and, and Josh, you, you laid out a challenge for 90 minutes. This is a challenge the ITU has been trying to address for 154 years. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to emphasize the point that, that Thomas was making and also Matthew on collaboration. Uh, and I agree with, with Matt's that, you know, probably the, po the policymakers and the regulators will never catch up because the technology will continue uh, to move ahead at, at leaps and bounds. But I do think we're at a point where it's not sustainable to just continue business as usual. Uh, we did reach the 50% connectivity mark last year. We were all excited. Uh, but of course, 50% of the world is still not connected. And even the 50% that are connected, we would argue that they're not necessarily meaningfully connected. So there's all sorts, sorts of other things that need to be addressed from uh, taxation to, uh, Rob, you mentioned on, on Sunday, some of the spectrum challenges uh, on the licensing side. There's lots of different regulatory and policy um, issues that need to be addressed if we're actually going to succeed uh, in having meaningful and inclusive connectivity for all. Thank you. Let, let me ask you to just expand on that, because uh, that was in my uh, prep notes here that I'm supposed to ask. Is, what are the barriers? to meaning, being meaningful collective. You mentioned regulatory and policy barriers. Just talk a little bit about what those are. So I would say one of the main barriers is uh, around affordability. So um, connectivity remains prohibitively expensive. We have set up a target that uh, connectivity should not exceed 2% of monthly GNI, and I think uh, and Rob would know better, but in some African countries, it can still be between nine, I think, and, and 20% of monthly income. So it's still prohibitively expensive, and that's uh, taxes on, on devices and on services. Uh, I would say the other barrier is like lack of trust and security issues, which is a rising uh, challenge that keeps people offline. Uh, relevance, lack of relevant content, and, and also skills. Uh, really, the lack of basic digital skills to be able to use technology to improve lives is, is still a barrier. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to go to Dr. Melbourne. Thank you. Uh, my name is Claire Malamed. I'm the CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So 
I'm very happy that Matt's uh, brought up partnerships straight away. That's kind of my special subject. I worked out uh, the other week when I was preparing papers for our board meeting that since we were founded in 2015, we've now brokered over 50 partnerships between, largely between kind of governments and companies and often involving academia and civil society around the production and the use of data. So we kind of know what, we know what it's about. And I think I sometimes get kind of frustrated in, you know, in environments like this. We sort of always, we say partnership is the answer, and of course it is, but we shouldn't underestimate how incredibly difficult and resource intensive it is to actually broker a partnership. It kind of seems so obvious that people should be working together. Of course they should. But actually to get to the point where you have a partnership which is actually delivering and where the products that are being delivered are actually being used to make decisions, to improve outcomes, is incredibly difficult. And we, you know, the sort of really intensive work that my team do on you know, working with governments on setting up the kind of institutional frameworks, getting the political buy-in, and we often, you know, we need to keep remembering that if you're working with governments, this is a sort of political process, and you need that kind of consent and support from, on a political level as well, and, of course, the capacity that's already been, you know, that's already been mentioned, really, and sort of, you know, absolutely shouldn't underestimate in many parts of the world the sense that, New, these new technologies also require new skills, you know, and we've perhaps all sort of internal, you know, we've become so used to having people around who can just do this stuff that shouldn't forget that that's not true in many parts of the world. Um, so I think part, I mean, I completely agree with you that partnership is essential, but I think if we're going to do that, it's a lot more than just saying it. It's incredibly difficult and complicated and time consuming, but ultimately, absolutely rewarding and essential process. Well, thank you. Let me then ask you to, since we're all sitting here and we have this opportunity, uh, what are the things the other people at this table could do to make it less difficult? What are the obstacles that seem unnecessary and what are the, uh, what are the things that your organization could use in order to you know, enable them to, to avoid the, the, all these difficulties that you're referring to? I mean, I think some of the difficulties simply come from us not having been doing it for very long. Some of the difficulties are just about sort of different language and different, I mean, I often get frustrated. There's something that really bugs me in some of these conversations where often if you're starting with a sort of technology partnership, the, uh, the aim of the kind of first phase of the partnership is often to develop a sort of use case. And, you know, we kind of start with the language of the use case. But that is a language which actually, you know, I don't find often when we're working with governments, the use case language is not quite sort of naturally how they think, because it's not about does it work, it's kind of is it useful? Does it actually do solve my problem in a way which is a good use of resources for me, which I can get political support for and communicate in a way which will get buy-in from those people who need to kind of give me permission to do my job? Will the public like it? Are there threats here? So I think there's a kind of language, there's a sort of learning how to talk to each other, which is just partly about putting the time in. I think another thing that really is often a barrier is, which is kind of connected, is the expectation of quick results. And I think we often, you know, organizations like ours, which, you know, rely on donor funding and other resources and on the sort of, you know, these, th these partnerships always rely on goodwill, and that's, you know, that's kind of how the world goes round. Um, but we often set ourselves very unrealistic time frames and we expect very quick results and everyone is waiting and you know we promise to our political or funding masters that things are going to happen really quickly and then of course that sends people down a particular track of doing things that can be done quickly and in ways which can be done quickly which is not always the key for the kind of long-term sustainability and particularly when we're trying to take something right down the track we often I think also stop too soon so we kind of get a partnership, we create a lovely shiny thing and we all get really excited and then we're like, okay, we've done that. But actually what, what we need to do is to sort of see that through and make sure that that exciting shiny thing is used and is kind of embedded in a system of decision making and actually starts to improve people's lives, you know, that we see it right through to the end. And I think sometimes we kind of stop too soon. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to go to Mr. Shooter. Thank you. Morning. Uh, it's a, I have much to say. It's a great passion of mine, this topic. 
Um, I think the first thing to say is that if we look across Africa, where most of our operations are, 17 markets, um, you have roughly one-third of people connected to the internet. You also have only roughly one-third have got access to... Introduce yourself, please. Just introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Rob Schuter. I'm the group CEO of MTN. We, um, so we have one-third uh, of the population accessing the mobile internet only, one-third. And we have only one-third uh, who have access to basic banking products. So financial inclusion is as significant a challenge as digital inclusion. And in the end, this is an, an inclusivity uh, discussion. Um, and I do believe the mobile telecommunications industry has an enormous role to play in breaching both, both of these divides. Um, I think when it comes to you know, the, the will of the private sector, maybe just responding to what, what Kate was saying earlier, um, if we were having this discussion 10 years ago, we would be discussing how do we get coverage across these markets so people can make voice and SMS calls. And that problem was solved. Um, and that infrastructure was rolled out by the private sector in the end um, with enormous challenges like lack of electrification, uh, infrastructure, uh, etc. And I think there's some good lessons as to why did that work and what can we learn going forward. I think you had very good alignment between the regulatory frameworks and the operators. So long licenses were awarded that gave plenty of time for, for payback on investment. Um, there was enough low band spectrum that you could cover these rural areas you, you know, at a cost effective basis. The private sector in the end through competition, the tariffs came right down. Nobody's saying that voice calls are too expensive in Africa. Um, and the final major, major factor was that the cost of the devices came down enough that they were accessible to the majority of the population. And if we look at the challenges now on uh, digital inclusion, I would say much more fundamentally, um, we have a demand problem than a supply problem. You know, almost 70% of the continent is covered with 3G or 4G services, but only one third are connected. So what is the issue with that third that's in the middle? And most of the time, it's actually that the cost of the handsets is too expensive. So that is really a, a major, major um, uh, area. Um, to be worked on. And then just to build on, on the comment of, of, of uh, my colleague here on, on the regulation, um, there are real regulatory challenges with financial services because often these are areas that are regulated by central banks or so used to regulating banks. And you do need much more um, flexible regulation, particularly when people come from one sector into another. I think that's fundamentally what's happening in, in the mobile financial services space, is that you have a regulatory framework designed for banks, but you really need to modify it to allow the, the telecommunications companies to operate. And, and that really does need uh, flexibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you hit a lot of points there. I'm going to go now to uh, our uh, Deputy Commissioner for UNHCR, Kelly Clement. Thank you very much, Josh. I'm Kelly Clements uh, at UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, and at building on what Rob just said, but also other speakers, coming back to this issue of the public-private piece uh, with regard to what are some of the, the drawbacks. You won't be surprised to know that you know, where we come from, uh, from UNHCR, is the 70 million people who are forcibly displaced in the world. Uh, the stats that Rob just mentioned are no different for the, the refugee population. You know, half have access. Uh, and it's a combination of factors. We did some important work with GSMA with regard to the policy, the legal, legal and regulatory frameworks that were too rigid, actually, um, in order to recognize identification, for example, to have access to SIM cards. Um, so what happens then? You have uh, refugees, for example, that will go illegal routes in terms of the black market. That works for a certain period of time until they're caught. And then, of course, then have completely no access, no access. Why is that important? You're talking about this is a key way for service information to be delivered through, through mobile uh, technology in terms of where to find health care or, or food or um, uh, pot potentially a house as you're, as you're going along the way, um, and also not being able to connect with family and friends. You've got affordability issues, which is uh, obviously was just mentioned as being another key issue, and then there's the infrastructure, you know, in terms of coverage. So in term the, the, the public 
uh, private piece becomes critical because you need to have um, certainly all of these pieces into place, but you also need to hear directly from those that are going to be using the materials. That, you know, it's people at the center um, in terms of what we're doing on this. I know we'll get into the discussions related to the ethics of it. It's people at the center do no harm. So when we talk about making sure that you've got the right regulatory framework in mind, you have to keep talking to the customer base. And in this case, of course, uh, refugees forcibly displaced become critical to the equation. Thanks. Uh, thank you, yes, and we will move to uh, a focus on the ethics in just a little bit, but I'm enjoying what we're doing here right now on inclusivity, so let's keep going on that track. But while you have the mic, I'd just like to follow up. We've heard some talk about the sustainable development goals, right? something that we all hear about, uh, but you're in a position to tell us, how's that going? <laughs> and what's, you know, That's wh a where, where are we? longer than 90 minutes. <laughs> It depends, and thanks, Josh, for raising it, because clearly the leave no one behind, what we're talking about, and I'm sure uh, Erika will come in on this point as well, you have to think about those that, that have perhaps the most vulnerability. Um, it depends which piece we're talking about here. When it comes to inclusion, Rob and I were just having a quick sidebar, are there some bright spots? Yes, there are, and so if we talk about, for example, connectivity, you have an example of Uganda, for example, that just uh, indicated in the last month that they would use a refugee ID as enough to be able to buy a SIM card or have access to a SIM card. That's huge progress. So in terms of that goal, we are making progress. But there are then the, the other parts of, of the equation in terms of where you see for security and other reasons, governments pulling back in terms of policies, making it much more difficult. Um, and we could go through all of the SDGs, but I'm sure we don't have time for that. <laughs> Which governments are pulling back? Uh, well, most recently, unfortunately, Bangladesh has just made an announcement, and that will affect a million Rohingya refugees um, in Bangladesh now. Um, that is something, obviously, we're, we're, we're hoping will somehow be reversed, um, but this would uh, cut off a lifeline for many. Just before I let you go, uh, funding on uh, achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, are, how much funding is needed? How much funding do we have? What's, where are the shortfalls? Well, on the humanitarian portfolio, we have um, probably between a third and 40% covered currently. And it depends what we're talking about uh, with regard to which hotspots. Some are better funded than others. But even, for example, let's go back to the Bangladesh example with regard to the Rohingya. This uh, particular, and this is a very strong humanitarian development uh, agenda for the government that we're in to be able to support, it is only a third funded. Um, this, we have to, rem we have to remain uh, on. On our, on our radar. And who's supposed to fund the other two-thirds of that? Well, we need support from everyone, public, private, uh, the individual citizens. One, some of our most important support right now come from individual giving uh, because it comes without strings attached. It comes where we can put the dollars where they are most needed. Uh, and this is something that in terms of being able to provide additional support to people in need. Very interesting, very interesting, thank you. I want to come to you in a second, but since we're on this topic, I want to come to Enrica uh, from the World Food Program. And you seem thank you, uh, yes, I'm Enrica Porcari from the World Food Program, and I think taking on from what Kelly was saying, I think we, we, are, we touched upon the affordability. So cost of infrastructure, cost of um, devices is coming down, becoming more affordable, the percentages are becoming better. Um, the applicability is getting there. There are more and more organizations that are willing to produce because just having devices is not sufficient. Just phone calls and SMS is no longer serves the need of inclusion in, in the sense of um, you know, health and uh, um, education. So th this is growing. Where we still have a big challenge is on the accessibility. And accessibility, I'm not talking about the coverage. I'm talking about the fact what Kelly was saying. There is still a billion people in the world who don't have the basic identities. And so we are applying 20th century you know, regulation for which you need an identity to be able to get an SMS or to have a bank account or a mobile you know, wallet and to people who don't. So it's Kelly saying, you know, we know of the 83 million people that we, that we serve in, at the Wolf Food Program, there are many who don't have this basic identity and not are able to do it. So in some countries, we act as the, as the broker. So we, as a Wolf Food Program, buy SIM cards with the approval of the mobile network operators and give them to the, to the beneficiaries who wouldn't be able to do it themselves. Now, again, going back to the public-private collaborations, shouldn't we try to address this problem? 
not trying to find you know way around. This is not fair. This is not fair because then there is there is never going to be an inclusion until they need to have a broker because the 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 regulations doesn't you know take into account that these people don't have an identity. So do we really need an identity, whether it's a fundamental, it's a foundational identity or a functional identity, like you know the World Food Program could get? Do they really need that, or should we try, you know, should we rethink the way in which we we provide this? And I think G we're having a lot of discussions with GSMA, who's helping us advocate for for some of this work. And so I think until we solve this, until we really enable everyone to have that access, th there is not going to be inclusion. The inclusion is still going to be for the ones who have been included. They're just going to be more inclusive and then they're going to be more affordable. But we are going to leave people behind. So let's not fool ourselves that we don't you know, leave no one behind. We are leaving people behind because we are not correcting this basic issue. So, Can you tell us what you think the fix is and exactly how you fix it? Well, I think at other recognizing um, functional identities that can be given by you know, uh, uh, agencies or just not expecting that there is a foundational identity provided by a government, especially, you know, and Kelly knows this very well, you know, a lot of the refugees that you serve, they, they have no government. They're, they're stateless. So UNHCR provides these identities that should be recognized and, and governments shouldn't pull, pull back. Why do we need to have an identity, um, an identity card, you know, uh, issued by a legal government when we know that legal governments are not always, you know, everybody's right. So let's rethink, let's open up our mind and think that if we really want to be inclusive, we need to think that the world is not what the world used to be in the 20th century and is need, the same regulations cannot serve the, the new realities. We have a two-finger intervention from Kate and then we'll go here. I wanted to come back to a couple of questions that you've asked, uh, Josh, in terms of some practical solutions and maybe uh, offer to this group a potential framework to think about this, not, not for on behalf of the Digital Impact Alliance, but just maybe for digital inclusion overall. So our view is, is that in order for digital inclusion to be reached and for the SDGs to be achieved, we have to move from this idea of technology sort of being a novelty or something to either regulate or just introduce or only let the market, and we actually have to reach a point at which it's institutionalized or made routine. We have to stop talking about the tech and go back to the fact that we're really just trying to achieve and provide life-giving services to a lot of people who are really left behind. And so you've asked a couple of times, Josh, like how does one do that or how do we think about solutions versus stating the problems? And, and we sort of offer the following framework that we find useful is that first is an investment in products. Right? There's an investment in pure technology products that actually are platforms that can work that are outside of these individual silos in which we've been investing for the last 20 years of agriculture or education or uh, food, World Food Program or humanitarian response. Platforms, technology platforms, are fundamentally not built that way. And so we need to think about how we have less platforms that we all invest in more that are actually robust and have these protections built into them that Rick is very rightly pointing out. We need better business models, to Matt's point earlier. We need to have better pricing, to Rob's point around supply and demand. Like, we have a big supply and demand mismatch at this point in time. And looking at how to combine financing around those, what we call sort of the pricing P, is actually really critical. To Matt's point and many others, like, this is about digital literacy. This is the people. We're throwing a lot of tech over the <laughs> gauntlet. And very few people, and it's not just the developing world, most people in most agencies I talk to don't, and I come from the tech sector before I moved into this, don't actually understand the technology terribly well. So we need to build digital literacy as a capability that everyone can do, both for the people who are choosing and using it, but also the ones who are using it. And last, but certainly not least, is the very important policy side of this. And I think we're starting to touch on that. Where do we thread the needle where we actually have enough people who really understand the technological intricacies, not just as how it exists now, or to Enrique's point, Enrique's point of how it, it works today, but what's it gonna, what, how are we future-proofing this for the next 20 or 30 years? Because this is not a question that's gonna be solved, and it, the tech always moves faster than the policy. Working at Microsoft for a decade, like it was much quicker than we ever were, and we were at the heart of it at the time 20 years ago. So how do we actually build those pieces in and bring this group together in a new form of collaboration to actually achieve this idea of institutionalization? Short list of things to do. Um, sir, so thank you for waiting. Thank you for being patient. Sure. 
Uh, Sigve Brekke, I'm heading Telenor Telecom Company uh, based in Norway, uh, but doing most of our business in Asia, uh, 180 million customers. A lot to comment on here, but let me start a little bit with the regulation issue. I, I don't think it's about neither light touch nor, nor heavy touch. It's about modernizing regulations. And, and what I'm thinking about is that the telecom sector, it's, it's still being perceived as only doing communication services whereby we are moved way beyond that. We are now at data access, uh, uh, doing data access services, which means that there is a lot we can do uh, based on that data access uh, that has to, uh, much larger impact than, than communication services. And I don't think that you in the emerging markets like we are operating, Bangladesh, you mentioned that, uh, we are also in the neighboring country, Myanmar, you will never get inclusion if you are not using the data access as a platform. Some examples. Starting with identity, you mentioned that. Uh, in Pakistan, there are 60 million kids that do not have any identity. They basically don't, they don't exist. What we have done is to go into the villages with a mobile app to register them, send their information to the central database, and back comes the first ID number. That works in Pakistan. Unfortunately, in some other of the Asian markets, we are not allowed to do that uh, due to regulations. They do not trust that we do this the right way. Uh, financial services, as Rob is mentioning, we do that in a couple of our markets, but unfortunately, in most of the markets, the, the existing banking system doesn't allow that uh, for us to move in there. Uh, and there will never be bank branches out in the villages. Medical sector is another example. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to bring medical services uh, uh, based on the data access, and there will never be built hospitals out in some of these markets. Uh, agriculture sector is a third one. Uh, we can connect the farmers to uh, and cut off the middlemen, but we are not, to do, uh, not allowed to do that in many markets. All this has to do with legacy business that are protecting their existing business models, and you need then modernized regulation. Take the last example. We want to use mobility data to predict the outbreach of diseases. For example, we are, we are doing that in Pakistan again to see where people are moving uh, to better and help, to help the, uh, the health authorities to figure out where to put in vaccine. Some of the markets are not allowed to do that for privacy reasons. So this is why I'm talking about modernized regulation and, and, and how you can use the data connectivity that nobody else has. We, we are connecting 5.2 billion customers in the mobile sector. Um, Second, just a short one of the second one. What are the barriers? I'm not so worried about affordability, uh, apart from the device uh, 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 cost. We are, we are making money out of a customer giving us one and a half US dollars per month. One and a half US dollars a month. Uh, in Norway, we, give, we get uh, $30 a month uh, and make money out of that. But in some of these emerging markets, we can get out to that level. And there is an affordability uh, to, to pay for that. The problem, uh, it's, it's not the customers. The problem are governments that are seeing us still as cash cows. Some of the markets, we pay 40% of the revenues in tax. Not the profit, their revenues. Uh, and we are not allowed to pass this on to the consumers. Uh, most of the markets, the spectrum is still uh, being auctioned out to maximize the prices. And there is no way we can then roll uh, out our networks in all the remote areas. One market uh, that, that is the best example we have seen is Myanmar. We got a license in Myanmar four years ago, uh, five years ago, uh, as one of the two. Uh, back then, the penetration of uh, any communication services uh, was 6%. Today is 60 in five years. Why is that? Because the government did it right. Uh, they, did, they gave away the licenses for free, but you had to commit to rollout obligations, service obligations, tariff obligations, uh, and so on and so forth. So they allowed us uh, to then roll out our network uh, up against uh, a bond that if you didn't do it, you had to pay. They allowed us to go into financial sector. They allowed us to go into the agriculture sector. And what happened? Yes, 60% of the population are now enjoying exactly the same services as we do in the Western part of the world. That's an example of how it can be done right. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, feel free to applause. Um, it strikes me that if you can make money on $1.5 per month that I'm grossly overpaying for my phone <laughs> services. But that's a conversation for another time. I saw a two-finger intervention by Mr. DeBas. Yeah, I mean, I, 
the the R plus is much uh, much deserved on that one. Uh, and I think that the issue that he raised, which is quite right, is the how does um, connect connectivity considered as a utility? Because right now it's considered as an kind of a luxury thing that people can have. Because that same type of whatever governments, when they regulate water or, um, or energy and things like that, the telecom industry is not given that level of attention. But it has increasingly become that. It has become a necessity. So we do have to increase uh, um, the knowledge of the, 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 the public sector to do that. And m public sector, in, in some cases, the public, uh, in the private sector, does suffer from a poverty of imagination where they cannot think beyond their jurisdiction, their, their realm of responsibility to not to think where this thing is going, as Kate mentioned about uh, future proofing. The other one uh, that uh, the gentleman mentioned is um, uh, our uh, carriers have a tremendous amount of agility to go from one industry to another. The same as he mentioned to the financial industry, uh, to medicine and what have you, uh, media, all those kind of things. Uh, but unfortunately, the government does not have that kind of agility. There is a word called jurisdiction, where a, a certain government agency cannot uh, regulate the other side. So how do we ensure those things can happen? Um, and the, other, the flip side of it, too, is that the same level of agility that you're showing, can you also replicate that to your possible com competitor, uh, competing industries so they can build products on your side, right? So it doesn't become a one-way street. So I just wanted to kind of uh, plug uh, that public institutions as regulators have confinement in terms of what lane they stay. So how do we kind of educate them? And again, I'm, I'm going back to my original point, so we can handhold them. So you, uh, Telenor, going into the medical industry, uh, the, uh, the medical field and what have you, does not create any type of problematic issues, be there be privacy and all that. Because that same privacy regulations that you have on the other side can also be applicable to that one. So I just wanted to echo that. Excellent. Thank you. We have uh, what I'm promised will be a quick two-finger intervention from Doreen, and then we'll go to Mr. Tennant. Yeah, no, very quickly to pick up on Sigve's point about the, the, the tax that's imposed on the, on the operators and the importance of getting the political will at the highest level, like the whole of government, it's really got to come at the top because the challenge is it's the ministries of finance. We have the ministry, the ICT ministries that come, uh, that's our sort of turf, but their challenge is the Ministry of Finance. And so that's what has to happen, that the Ministry of Finance has to understand that you can't keep taxing, taxing, uh, that we have to figure out a better approach for the Ministry of Finance to bring in revenue. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I'm relatively new to this, um, and where I come from in Australia, a, a two-finger interventions actually pretty offensive actually <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so maybe I'll just pause there and think about the cross-cultural issues that I'm confronting so um, I, I lead the sec I lead the International Chamber of Commerce um, we're in the midst of our centennial we're a purpose-led institution we are the institutional voice for 45 million businesses north and the south developing developed SMEs all the way through to Microsoft and all these sorts of fellows and, and organizations around the world I just want to come back, uh, Kelly, to a point you made and a bit of a debate we had before about um, financing the SDGs. And then I want to pick up a little bit on this governance issue because I think that's uh, going to be pretty, uh, pretty sharp for us all. On the financing issue, uh, it's kind of always weird to me. As I said, I'm really new to this, but I, I did check a few things. Like when the SDGs came in, there was actually a conference in Addis Ababa on financing for development. I, I now call that the kind of orphan comp, uh, 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 I think it was announcement. Uh, the reason I say that is actually it made a very specific point. In order to support the implementation of the SDGs, we had to help shift financial markets to support long-term investment. We seem to have forgotten that bit, by the way. And the reason I say that with some authority, because I also then checked, because I'm dealing with a particular issue which confront, confounds a lot of SMEs and micro SMEs in the Caribbean economy, in Central Europe, in the South Pacific, uh, in Africa, which is the failure of correspondent banking, because people cannot align themselves with KYC and AML. 
Um, and for those of you like me who didn't know what they meant until I got into this, uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering. And so what's actually happened is because the Financial Stability Board, which is ultimately where the risk is weighted, has not shifted the risk weightings, you've actually got banks knowingly withdrawing from correspondent banking, excluding, therefore, uh, SMEs and micro-SMEs in the Caribbean economies, for example, for participating in global, the global economy, because they can't get financing. That's a choice that was made. If I was Greta, I would say that's a choice that's been made knowingly that there is bad that will follow, and some could say that's evil. Um, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> what I'm going to say instead is that what we look with the SDGs on the financing side, without its ABBA, is that to shift the markets, we have to respect long-term investment, investment in infrastructure, and investment in the developing world. When you look at the FSB, how do they weight those? They are weighted as high risk, high risk, high risk, which means the cost of capital support, to actually what you have to hold, is extremely expensive. Now, I understand why they do this, because They've spent the last 10 years saving the financial system from itself. My view on the SDGs financing is we now have to help shift the FSB to spend the next 10 years getting the finance community to help save the world. And that's actually what we're focused on. Uh, I may put it too baldly or too generally, but at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of ways of escaping the argument. But fundamentally, that's what it comes down to. We have to re-weight risk globally to enable long-term investment in the infrastructure that supports engagement with the, uh, uh, with the developing world uh, and also uh, and actually in, in the developing world itself. Without that, we'll continue to wonder why all these good things are happening and that they can't kind of bounce back. So you've got a fundamental misalignment of the policy frameworks that should be enabling the support for the SDGs. I just want to flip to governance if I could. Um, uh, Matthew, uh, I feel like I'm stalking Matthew today. We we're just somewhere else this morning. And maybe, are we going to head a state lunch as well? I mean, we're, we'll all be there. Um, you made an interesting comment about someone from Microsoft saying to you that they now want regulation. Well, it's very interesting for us because we actually are of the view that at a global governance level, it's highly unlikely that governments are going to agree upon the commons that will actually enable us to curate the next century at this point in time. There's just too much going on. There's too many differences, too many trade-offs. It's not going to happen. OK, so that's pessimistic. The optimistic side is where we then, as the International Chamber of Commerce, step in. because. As I said, we're, institu we're, we're institution, we're actually a not-for-profit, we set norms and standards, we actually have our own courts, we actually have an ICC governance structure. And in the 20th century, we stepped in where governments couldn't act because in the end, business took the view that it should, we needed to go on. And businesses actually subject themselves to our governance model, which is acceptable to civil society because we have an enforcement mechanism and we can actually help govern that model, that govern that part of the economy until governments can catch up. In a sense, we help and curate it along the way. And most importantly, what we're seeing now with the potential split in the digital economy on a geopolitical basis is that we may actually have a role as well, and we're actually thinking about how we do this, in terms of ensuring interoperability between the two. And we're in the midst of doing this. Uh, we've, just, we've launched a, a Centre for Future Trade in Singapore, the whole idea of which originally was to take analogue trading into di the digital world, and we've created blockchain solutions, etc. And now we're realising that one of the huge problems you confront, even in the blockchain game, is the lack of interoperability because of the lack of a public distributive ledger. Well, actually, we can create that. But the reason I'm saying all this is because ultimately we want to support systemic change. And you can only support systemic change if you can get scale and you have clear governance models. And that's where we want to step up onto these sorts of things. So we want to be able to help enable these businesses to secure peace, prosperity and opportunity for all globally. We actually want to help SMEs get access to blockchain. So one of the things we've done in creating our own blockchain, and we're focused really on, I mean, there's, as you know, a lot of hyper hyper around blockchain. We think it's most uh, immediate values in traceability. Because one thing we're very worried about is looking at SMEs and micro SMEs, particularly in the developing world, who are actually being excluded from supply chains because they cannot show that they're actually producing goods and services in a sustainable way. 
So we have created a, a blockchain uh, solution to that, which we actually create, it's a public good, we're giving it out. We're democratizing access to blockchain. Because without that, what is actually happening is an evil is actually happening by, potentially by accident, though it may well be a bit more by design, that some of these um, entities, because they cannot show their sustainable production, are actually being excluded by the, from the supply chain. They are actually seeing the value of their businesses diminish, and guess who's buying them up? The same people who've created the supply chain uh, uh, opportunity. So our job here is to step in to create an enabling uh, uh, system to enable businesses in the developing world. And it's delightful to see Kelly here, because I mean, uh, ICC and I've had a personal involvement with UNHCR for so long. What we're trying to do with UNHCR is to try and help deliver the comprehensive refugee response framework by helping shift the way that UNHCR operates, operates to be more open to the private sector. We're not a cash cow, we're actually an ideas factory as well. We want to bring new ideas to solving some of these problems. So thank you. Excellent, excellent. You're going to be the next speaker, but before that, I'm going to use your excellent comments as a segue uh, from the discussion of inclusivity to the discussion of ethics. And I, as I listen to this table, not being an expert or a practitioner, but being interested in these issues, when I hear about financing, infrastructure, you know, access, um, expansion, seems to me, seems to a lot of us that it's hard to discuss these issues on a governance international without discussing what uh, is going on uh, in China and with, with One Belt, One Road, uh, Chinese government uh, 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 expansion into governance and rules and standards internationally, and also how the Chinese companies that are, um, uh, that are involved in this expansion uh, uh, may definitely are susceptible to the influence of a of, uh, of the Chinese government, which may not be bought into the ideas in this digital declaration, which talk about privacy and securing personal data, mitigating cyber threats, all right? And I think all of us in this room know that uh, the Chinese government takes different approaches to these values than a lot of governments in free and open societies. And uh, that seems to me to be the elephant in the room, and I just want to tackle it head on. And I, I would like to go to you, Matthew Rago. Thank you. What's the UK government I, I, position I, on China? I, 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 I will come to that, but can I just quickly pick up the other point that John was making about the, and, and others about the money, um, to, to make the point that if we are serious about leaving no one behind, then we've got to put our money where our mouth is. It is expensive to leave no one behind, and as Kelly and others have make, been making clear, we do not have enough money available to do everything that we have said we will do, which requires more stepping up more countries to meet the, the UN target of spending 0.7% of our gross national income on, on international development, for instance. But it also, thinking about the humanitarian crises and thinking about the likelihood of even more of these crises being caused by uh, climate change in, in the future, and even more of those events being bigger and more disruptive than they are, and those events also having a bigger impact on the people who are the most vulnerable, all of which is likely to happen. We've got to do a better job than we are currently doing about shifting to prevention rather than cure and making sure, partly for, if you like, finance ministry reasons of value for money, uh, among, amongst others, that we, that we invest in a country's resilience uh, and that we find ways of um, building up uh, their systems so that uh, they can uh, prevent some of these crises and prevent <coughs> the crises that are, uh, well, even if they can't prevent the crisis, they can prevent the impact of the crisis being so bad. On the, uh, on the ethical issues, um, I didn't realize you were going to put that particular elephant in the room, but um, uh, look, we, we, we need to be working with everyone who is involved in this effort. And lots of different countries and different cultures have very different views about ethics and values. But we can't, you know, n none of us around this table can sort of turn off the Belt and Road Initiative. We can't say, sorry, that doesn't meet our standards of development, therefore, you know, it shall not exist. It does exist. It's having a very significant impact uh, across the continent of, uh, of, of Africa and the globe. And I think we've got to find ways of, of working with it. And, and partly that means being able to flush out this issue about ethics and, and values. Um, but I, I would, I would uh, advocate seeking to do that in a way that allows us to get some form of um, 
coherence uh, across the world rather than um, sort of admitting defeat and saying, actually, there's, there, there are just such divergent ways of doing this that, we're, that it's never going to be possible. We've got to find a way of making it possible. Um, I'll go to you, uh, um, Mr. Grant, uh, and just add up um, an added little question. You have, as part of your coalition, major Chinese telecom com com companies, which are the largest growing uh, companies in terms of mobile telecom in the world. Um, yet your digital declaration calls for all of these things, digital privacy, secure personal data, mitigating cyber threats that perhaps even these companies, even if they wanted to, and I'm sure many of them do, can't guarantee, considering the governance structure that they're forced to live in. How do you square that circle? And then whatever it was you were uh, going to say. The digital declaration that we launched uh, six months ago is uh, obviously optional to be part of, um, and uh, we now have 60-odd CEOs signed up to it. Uh, and I think it's, it's critically important to have this debate. And I think what you said, Matthew, is, is absolutely right. We cannot turn things off. Uh, and um, it, 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 it's sort of what, what I get upset about is that when we sort of muddle the waters of technology on one side and ethics on the other, and then we put them together and say, you know what, the technology is to blame. We, we should not use the technology because it's bad. And that is not the case. I think it's, it's really, really important to separate them. I remember growing up in Sweden in the, in the 70s and uh, <clears throat> looking at the news uh, where the, it was described in horror what happened in London when the CCTV cameras were being installed in every corner and the UK government could spy on the citizens walking from home to office. Horrible. That was the Swedish view on it. Today, I think it's A, very accepted, and B, it's actually very positive because it's, it, it, it prevents crime. So I think we need to debate, we need to find ways of handling the issues. And digital declaration is an aspirational target to do exactly that. Um, AI is another fantastic example of where we can see, as, as you mentioned, Sigvin, and I know M10 is also doing a, a whole bunch of good stuff, where we know that we can prevent people dying people suffering, Matthew, you said it as well, of, of preventing things and, and making sure that we have an early warning system installed. Using technology, using IoT, using big data prevents that. We have huge opportunities to do that. I think it would be a, a crime to humanity not to use the technology, but we need to fix the ethics. We need to mature into uh, handling both sides here. Uh, Two-finger intervention, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. And I mean, I very much agree. And I think an additional issue that we face in trying to develop these sort of ethical frameworks is that people don't really know what they think. You know, there's no strong politics and civil society which is guiding governments. You know, if you think about previous eras of, you know, when they started regulating not putting children up chimneys or abolishing slavery or whatever, it started with a strong kind of change of view among society, and then they were demanding that government do something. And I think people don't know what they think about this stuff. And we have very somewhat contradictory views on it. We want privacy, but we love Google Maps. You know, and I sort of think until people know what they think, it's going to be very hard for governments to regulate in the public interest when the public don't really know what their interest is or what they want at this point. Enrico? Yeah. I think we live in a in a in a moment of a, of a perceived or apparent, you know, um, dichotomy between in the ethics. But part part of it is uh, is about how do we ensure, you know, the, the as humanitarian agencies, we do no harm, you know, and um, ensure that the privacy and the protection of the the most vulnerable people that we serve is is uh, is well afforded. Um, at the same time, how do we um, prevent from preventing them from having access to it. And I think that this is something that we can't just sit to even around the table um, and discuss. This is something that we need to, uh, as Matt said, some of these things take time. There is a cycle. And I think we need to be kind of open-minded about it, leave, leave, some of those, uh, leave some of the individuals that we think um, have or do not have the rights because we need to protect them to have the right of inclusion. And sometimes it feels to me that we're a bit uh, uh, patriarchal about it. You know, we determine what their future is because we, don't, we shouldn't do any harm to them. 
almost as if they were passive uh, recipients of aid, again, rather than being active, you know, members of a new inclusive digital society. And I agree with you that, that uh, there is a, a lot of digital literacy that we should be, but also let's not um, underestimate the fact that sometimes, you know, just give them, afford the tools and, and they will shape their own futures. I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in uh, um, kind of liberal uh, economies and, you know, and just give them the tools, give them the opportunities, afford them the, the, uh, the, the, the rights and, and they will all shape their own future and they will decide for themselves what type of information they want to share or not. Let's not determine with our own predefined paradigms uh, of what they should and should be given right to. And that's what I think is sometimes some of the perceived economy comes from this applying schemes that we make up around round tables and not in the field. So the World Food Program operates in some of the more, most complex environments where we feel that sometimes even again, both the legal framework and do not afford the, the furthest behind that ability to make a self-determining choice which I think we need to, uh, we, we may want to reconsider our stance on that. Sure, I think that point is well taken. And but just before I go to the speakers, I want to try one more time on this question of what is the impact of massive trillions of dollars of investment by the Chinese government and these very problems that we're talking about. And I'm going to put you on the spot, Mr. Denton, because you were talking about financing. And so you're talking about, you know, multilateral institutions, uh, Western financial institutions, Calculating high risk, it's drying up financing for people who need it the most. For for one belt and road, there's no there's no high risk. It's just tons and tons of money. For Chinese telecom companies, the the infrastructure, it's all steeply discounted. Talk to us about how that disrupts the things that you're trying to do well, if it does. Well, yeah, okay, uh, great question, Josh. Um, maybe I'll put it a different way if I could. Um, Think about this. Um, we have a series of um, uh, a set of global institutions which were created to support the operability of the Bretton Woods outcome. Okay, World Bank, IMF, etc. And of course, when this was all determined, the world was a certain shape. The weight of economic power was in the Northern Hemisphere. Asia was interesting, uh, potentially you know uh, uh, some growth there. But in terms of the weighting of the institutions and the way in which they were governed. I mean, you can look at the Security Council, et cetera. Uh, it, pre it, it reflected the predominance of power in the immediate post-war period. For any institution to continue to be relevant, it needs to actually transform itself and be relevant to the context in which it operates. Uh, that's been recognized. I mean, you saw what happened with the G20 moving from finance to leaders meeting. Uh, did that for a particular reason, because it was required at the time to give confidence to the world that there was a way forward. One of the most um, uh, interesting, but it's also ref uh, uh, relevant decisions of the G20 was that there would be a re-weighting of the voting rights in the IMF. That was an agreement of uh, G20 leaders. Um, that re-weighting did not occur in the time frame that was actually anticipated. Um, I'm not saying there's a direct correlation here, but it's, not, it's more than a coincidence that within a very quick period of time, we saw the emergence of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank out of China. We saw the actual movement around the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. What you saw was when institutions failed to reform themselves or transform themselves to make them relevant to the new shifts of power, then those who cannot participate at the level they want create their own institutions. In a way, the future was in our hands, but ultimately we did not act in line with commitments. Now, I'm not, you know, this is not a judgmental issue, it's an, it's an observation, and maybe uh, uh, over a longer period of time, where there might be interesting debate about is there a correlation, coincidence. But the issue there, when you look at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and I know I'm an Australian, and uh, we toot and froed as to whether or not we would engage, and. Uh, but the UK engaged before we did it. My God, you know, 25 percent of the Australian economy is exposed to China. We we actually kind of know the place. We didn't get in there. The problem with us not even getting in there is we weren't there to set the governance model. There was not respect played 
and this is something that's happening now, for the weighting of environmental risk, about the weighting of skills transfers in, in, in new infrastructure. It's only now that this is coming to the fore. We are not engaging effectively in actually creating new, I suppose, uh, ensuring that the norms of governance for a number of the new institutions that are arriving are aligned to the broader uh, global interests. So it's actually one of the jobs that we have before us, and obviously, you know, clearly I'm heavily engaged in, in articulating reasons why we should get involved in terms of helping lift the standards. And by the way, I am not anything other than clear-eyed about the ultimate interests at play here, but I'm also clearly engaged because I do think that business talking across the world, as has happened before, actually has more in common than not which is really why we at the ICC, when we have the World Council of the ICC, I can have ICC US sitting with ICC Iran. I can have ICC Israel sitting with ICC Palestine. Why? Because we have a genuine uh, commitment to the purpose which is enabling business worldwide. I understand that perfectly. I think that's the question we're, we're trying to get at here is how do we engage and how can we preserve uh, all these things that we believe in in light of these new developments? Um, I, I'd love to uh, hear from Ms. Pryor. Thank you. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Emily Corey Pryor and I run Data2x, which is focused on a word that has not been mentioned yet, which is gender, uh, which is incredibly important, I think, in terms of uh, having a meaningful conversation on inclusion and, and, and in ethics, really. Um, and I think I wanna say a few things. Um, I think that, first of all, when we think about the SDGs and when we think about Leave No One Behind, um, uh, the Honorable Matthews <laughs> point on, on the expensiveness of leaving no one behind is, is incredibly important. And I think we've talked about that financing issue um, in a few ways. Um, by no means am I saying that gender is the only uh, population that's being left behind, certainly not. Uh, but I think it's, it's um, when we think about half the population or more than half the population that is not represented in our current data systems, then that's something that we need to be really concerned about, particularly to the extent that the digital data systems can really have a meaningful and make a meaningful contribution to that, to that kind of counting. Um, when we were talking about financing earlier, I was thinking about you know, we care about financing for development, we care about financing for the SDG process, but in order for the SDGs, a framework on, yes, it's true that it's very hard for governments to agree on regulatory frameworks, we do have a framework, it's not a regulatory framework, but we do have a regulatory framework that, or sorry, a framework that every member state agreed to, which was the Sustainable Development Goals. But what is the method that we have for actually tracking and understanding our achievements as related to the sustainable development goals. For that, we have indicators. For that, we need data to, um, to understand our progress on that. From a gender perspective, we know we have less than half of the data that we need in order to do that. We also know that part of the reason for that lack of data is just a systematic underfunding of the entire system. So at a minimum, we need from a, not only from a gender perspective, but really for all data, at a minimum, we need another $170 million a year in ODA in order to actually have the data that we need. And I think that kind of underlining infrastructure point that exists is not always the sexy point to make, which is why I think we don't have the money there in the first place, but it's incredibly important to actually know where we are. Um, and so I think that that is, is something that we we truly need to be digging into and thinking about new ways to kind of make that point and raise that. The other piece I wanted to, to just think about as we, as we bridge from the inclusivity part to the ethics part is thinking about who's represented in, particularly when we think about digital data systems. We know that although we've made, and GSMA has done some fantastic work on that, I don't work for GSMA, but I admire their work, um, on understanding um, kind of the gender gap. And while we know that that has been shrunk in terms of women women's mobile phone ownership, we also know that we haven't completely closed that gap. And when we think about um, the role that digital data can play in terms of um, other pieces of inclusion in lives and in opportunities, so when we think about medical opportunities, when we think about financial inclusion and the huge role that digital data or that digital um, devices can play, I think that that's going to require having a gendered perspective and a representation of the gender perspective in all 
all of these conversations. Um, and I think there's really some um, unique ways. I think there's some very concrete ways in which the public sector and the private sector can really be working um, productively together in order to make that happen. Excellent. Thank you. All good points. Uh, Thomas. Thank you. Um, I have three points I want to make, but I, it's, um, it's surprising that we're, we're talking about the digital future, but there haven't much conversation about the, the awesome future that's coming up because of 5G. And, and I know ITU is about to have the summit in Cairo, which will kind of open the floods of innovation on that basis. Um, so on that note, within the context of uh, 5G, um, the open and equal future that we're talking about seems to uh, have a, a bias to consumers, which is obviously the first users of these technologies. But how does that openness also goes to creators? Consumers are also creators who might be able to address the affordability that we're talking about and what have you. How does the industry then open itself up? to new and up-and-coming up startups and things like that, who would be able to use the infrastructure to bring affordability. So I just want to kind of point that out. The second one is obviously, uh, Josh talked about the, the biggest elephant, uh, the biggest dragon, so to speak, um, <laughs> in the infrastructure side. And the word here is trust. So if we're going to talk about, both on the, on the regulation side, trust is the key word, right? How does public institutions trust the infrastructure, therefore, the type of um, regulator. And the same thing, how do consumers trust if uh, the, the DNA of your infrastructure is prone for not having trust? Uh, how do you kind of overcome that? That's more of a, not a point, but a question to, to, to the group. Uh, the third one is there is a lot of talk, at least in Silicon Valley and other places, about making this new innovation of 5G open source uh, instead of proprietary. How does that? And essentially, to extend trust, to extend, to, I mean, to, uh, to, uh, to borrow examples of open source in other industries, how does the 5G become that? So that's, and again, I'm not making a point. I just wanted to pose it to the industry leaders, how they're viewing uh, these issues. We have a two-finger intervention by Matt. Yeah, so, so firstly, I think uh, trust is one thing. The infrastructure, as you rightly said, remember what Rob said. If you take the world... 50% of the world is connected now to the internet. 50% is not. And why is that? Well, 40% are covered by some sort of mobile broadband network, 3G or 4G, and pretty soon 5G, 40%. 10% is not covered. So this is rapidly moving away from being an infrastructure issue to what Sigve said, that we are no longer mobile operator, we are a digital access provider. So we need to look at getting other people to chip in, to create the content that is relevant for people to actually want to be on this thing. Here in the US, there is a usage gap. We, we talk about coverage gap where you're not covered and usage gap when you don't use the thing. Here in the US, 23% of the population don't use this. Could be affordability, could be skills, it could be no local, well, no content that is relevant for me, or it could be security concerns or whatever. That is one of the issues that we absolutely have to tackle. In Africa, it's certainly it's, it's about 50%, 40% or so, which is the usage gap. Coverage gap is little. That's the small thing. And that we have, from private money, uh, uh, managed to build out to almost, uh, as I said, almost 100%. We have another 10% to go. Can I ask you to address Thomas's question about open source, right? We hear about this idea of moving everything to open source seems like Good idea from the security side, but maybe a risk for the businesses. I don't know what no, you think. No, no, no. I mean, we are discussing that to, to move uh, away from from more or less proprietary solutions, which has been the the whole GSMA journey for 30 years ago. I mean, if you remember the the first generation or second generation of of mobile systems, they were linked from the handset all the way into the, the network as such, and then back up to the handset. They were a Motorola equipment, or it would be an Alcatel or Lucent equipment, uh, or Ericsson for that matter. Now it's completely decoupled. This handset works everywhere. 4G was the first technology that was commonly accepted and commonly rolled out throughout the world, the first time ever. 3G, we had many different standards. 2G, a lot of different standards. 5G is also going to be a common standard globally. So open source is certainly something we're looking into. It is more complex, but gives us more resilience as well. Excellent. And we're going to get to everybody, but 
uh, before we do, I'm wondering if anyone, I'm going to take one more chance to address Thomas's question about trust here. If the DNA of, of the infrastructure that is being built under um, One Belt, One Road and other uh, um, projects can't be trusted, how do we get over that? How do we deal with that? How, anybody? Okay. Um, I, I just want to come back to sort of an earlier question around the infrastructure, and your, your question makes this premise that you can't necessarily trust the Chinese. I'm not going to get into that particular debate, but I'd like to highlight there's 70 countries that have no data privacy regulations on the books at all. So you're asking about, you know, um, how this would work. And then we, we talked about digital literacy and digital capacity. You know, there are governments that their ministry of telecommunications is two people. When you combine those two things together, when someone comes and says, I can invest in you, I can help you set up your infrastructure to respond to your disaster, I can help you provide and build out the entire structure that you need, and I'm going to bring money and people to do that. The rational choice as that country is to take the is to take the help, and so unless we look to your question was how do how do you actually change that paradigm is like you do to what other people have said need to invest in that and then the support so that those seventy countries with nothing and then many many others including my own that probably needs a lot of modernization to other people's points we actually need to invest in kind of coming together to actually upgrade what we think about that and call on data and consider the data as a human right that we all should be investing in to make sure that we have the appropriate regulation to take place. Hi, Joseph Lubin. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a project, a blockchain project called Ethereum and founded a company called Consensus, which uh, has built out uh, a good swath of the Ethereum ecosystem and we build uh, uh, products platforms and services on, on the Ethereum platform. Um, I've been a little hesitant to speak up in this context because it is uh, um, a big context with lots of um, big goals and challenges. And we are a technology that is uh, uh, in its most powerful form, uh, Ethereum, about five years, 10 months, and 28 days old. And so, um, we are um, just approaching uh, issues of scalability, privacy, and confidentiality, and we're moving really quickly on those fronts. But um, uh, we are building systems at a scale that we can manage right now, and uh, so we're not quite ready to, to manage these bigger problems. We have built solutions uh, that are quite relevant in certain contexts, in particular uh, for payments, payments across borders. Um, we can do that. We can do it with KYC and AML. We can do it with uh, price-stable tokens. There are hundreds of those being built. Uh, over half of them are on the Ethereum platform. Um, buying things across borders is not about getting somebody to ship you the product. It's about being attached to, to payment systems, uh, being able to make that payment. And so uh, our technology is making that possible right now. Um, with respect to uh, supply chain systems, track and trace systems, with respect to provenance, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of work um, tracking sustainable tuna fishing um, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the consumer products industry. Uh, we'll have an announcement soon with a, a major consumer products group about how people can um, pull things off the shelf and uh, track the, uh, the source of the raw materials that uh, those consumer products uh, were made from. Um, the Profound innovation uh, that is blockchain um, is really usable in smaller contexts. It's usable inside corporations. It's usable in consortia. It's most exciting when you blow it out uh, on a global scale and you make it maximally decentralized across many different dimensions of decentralization. Uh, when you build uh, maximally decentralized systems, uh, you, or, or we will, uh, and we're approaching this, uh, we're going to be able to reformat the nature of trust systems on the planet. So uh, we currently live in a context of centralized and subjective trust. Um, so we 
uh, rely on people and organizations to adjudicate um, pretty much everything. Uh, and now we have a new technology that will enable us to move uh, towards automated trust, towards uh, objective trust, towards guaranteed execution of agreements. And so I, I think that's going to be pretty profound. Uh, once you have a new trust infrastructure in place. You can have a global settlement layer in place um, for different kinds of financial instruments. Uh, we can, with a global settlement layer, um, and we can move the elements of our society, be they money, identity, uh, legally enforceable agreements, uh, different kinds of certificates, other kinds of financial instruments. We can represent all of those in natively digital form, uh, and in natively digital form, we can trade these things, uh, payment versus payment, delivery versus payment, uh, so that there is no clearing and settlement. Clearing and settlement uh, uh, happens in the instant of the transaction. You can add some delays in there uh, for regulatory purposes, but we can um, move to a natively digital infrastructure where we squeeze the delays and the frictions out of our economies, and uh, I, I think that'll be a, an exponential growth engine. Um, so this base trust foundation gives us a few things. It gives us uh, digital scarcity, um, and we're building cryptocurrencies and financial instruments and uh, tokens that, that can fractionalize ownership of real estate and uh, so many different... Uh, um, elements um, on along those lines. Um, and perhaps most importantly, it, it gives us trustful collaboration. So in any sort of context, uh, we can all trust that no minority set of actors on these systems can improperly manipulate those systems. And so um, instead of being zero-sum competitive uh, going forward, we can probably um, build much more collaboration uh, into our systems and eventually, hopefully, collaboration will be uh, dominant uh, with respect to competition. With respect to the Dragon, um, uh, we, uh, we do a lot of work uh, with devices and provenance systems. Um, problem with these provenance systems is uh, garbage in, garbage out. You've got to get really high quality data into these systems. Once it's into these systems, they're tamper proof and, and they're going to uh, pass along the data vertically uh, and enable us to build supply chain networks. Uh, so um, I have been worried and others have been worried about the, the bifurcation of supply chain networks uh, in the planet. Um, uh, we um, have the potential uh, to build systems with uh, secure enclaves, trust, trusted execution environments so that data going into the system um, from different kinds of devices, from manufacturing plants, uh, can be rigorously um, sourced uh, from um, devices that have their own digital signatures. And so uh, the data itself will be signed, uh, the devices themselves will be signed, and um, if we're able to build supply chain networks using that technology, we could actually be at odds uh, with any nation and still um, have interoperative supply chain systems. And so I, I think that's um, potentially good news for uh, a um, potentially concerning situation. Very fascinating. A look into the near future, I hope. Um, we have, we're running out of time. We're going to have exactly three more speakers. One, two, three. If you could just keep your remarks short, uh, and then I'll, have, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Jennifer, thank you. Jennifer Ertley, BT in the Americas. Um, so BT obviously is a large consumer brand known well in the UK, uh, but actually we support global technology deployments for large multinationals around the globe, and that's what, what I'm responsible for. Um, we've talked about inclusion at the most macro level of humanitarian need, what we haven't, and we've, we've actually talked about the need to you know, open technologies so that we can future-proof, um, but I think that there's also a challenge that large corporations have to be innovative, to keep up with the pace of the startups, um, and, and to be relevant. And in order to, when you, when you look across the population at work, there are five generations at work, and so digital skills is an issue everywhere, even in the most developed countries. And in the UK specifically, there are 12 million people who don't have any digital skills. And that cost is about 63 billion pounds. And so what's interesting there is that when you think about partnerships, private-public partnerships, the need to reach into the community 
and bring along a future workforce is something that BT thinks a lot about because we need to make sure that we are increasingly relevant, especially as we're getting north of 150 years old. So, so reaching into the primary schools, we've put together a digital program in a box, uh, essentially, and we've reached two million kids in the UK through 70,000 teachers with this very basic package that, first of all, opens up the, the minds of teachers to allow them to think, hey, I actually can teach digital skills in my classroom. And so the opportunity to begin a conversation about coding in primary school and then carry it through changes. So I think that when we think about the importance of partnership, I think we need to also think about how we are training the workplace of the future. Yeah, so just, just a, a couple of comments. I mean, I think the first is, you know, mobile networks today are basically an assembly of different technologies from different vendors. Um, and the responsibility for making sure that that network and the customer's information um, that runs on the network, the responsibility for making sure that that is safe and secure and privacy is protected, lies with the network operator. So I don't think it's really fair to sort of single out a piece of equipment and say that that runs the risk of, of compromising. I think the second point is it's exactly because of this um, assembly of different components that we need standards. And 5G is a standard. You know, you need to have a standardization so different handsets in different companies on different frequencies and different equipment supplies, this can all stitch together and, and, and work uh, seamlessly. Um, th third point on 5G, I mean, the key advantages of 5G is it's faster, the latency is lower, it can handle more devices. It, it is nonetheless an evolution from 3G to 4G to 5G. And these are complementary technologies. And they will coexist in many markets for many years, also because of the distribution of handsets and frequencies, um, etc. And I think in a way what we really, really need to do is to sort of rise above these equipment, technology, vendor conversation. And, and I'd like to return to a comment I think that, that Kate made earlier, is that it, it's really about providing the connectivity and then doing something useful with it that is pushing forward the agenda of exclusivity. And, and I do very much believe that we have uh, too much a fragmentation of these platforms, too many disparate initiatives that if we want to make a meaningful impact, we've got to find a way to consolidate them if we really want to scale, whether that's in health or education or nutrition or some of your initiatives. Um, I, I think it's just going to go too, too, too slowly if we don't find a way to pull them together. So Josh, I don't think I'm doing your two-finger instruction properly because I have about four of them, but let me just very quickly, first to Emily's point of the half that we say don't, aren't connected, 89% in the forcibly displaced that, that are lacking. So it's clearly the gender lens is quite important when we're talking about this. Uh, to John's important point, we couldn't do it without the private sector. When we're talking about digital ID, connectivity, what have you, we have to have this conversation around a table and beyond, and that is absolutely essential to finding those solutions. Solutions. I want to come back to a point that Enrica made in terms of the patriarchal system or patronizing, maybe I would say. Um, we have to come back to the people at the center, and it gets to the several comments made about trust and building trust. Just as we as a, as a UN refugee agency have a strong data protection policy, we need the private sector to be investing in this and to build trust with these people that we're serving as customers in addition to people that we're serving. So to have a, that dual lens, I think, is going to be very important. And this is where we keep coming back to that feedback. Thanks, Josh. Well, I struggle to summarize all of this good content, but I'll give it a shot. A uh, couple of themes that I think have emerged over the last 90 minutes. The technology, the equipment's not good or evil. It's the people that are good or evil. And, the people who have the, the role in making sure that the technology is used for good and not evil. It strikes me that we haven't figured out a way to deal with the disruptive effects of uh, the Chinese strategy to uh, massively disrupt uh, infrastructure technology. And we haven't really even figured out a way to talk about it constructively. Maybe that we could deal with that next year. The, the sustainable development goals are underfunded, as is the system for tracking the data for those goals. And that seems like an easy thing that the people around this table could fix uh, sooner rather than later. Um, everybody knows that we need more public-private cooperation, more partnerships. 
Um, we don't know exactly what we need to do, but we, need, we, know, we know we need a lot more of it, and we need to make it a lot easier. You know? And overall, it strikes me that these issues are not confined to governments or companies or civil society. These are now issues that affect all of us and require a broad public education, and I hope that we have contributed in some small way to that today. Uh, please give all of our speakers a round of applause.